really an honor. All right. So, um, uh, as uh, as uh, you you just heard, uh, Steph and Pabst and I are both um, at Relational AI. Uh, we are um, a still fairly young startup uh, developing um, a brand new uh, relational knowledge graph database platform. And so um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about that platform uh, and uh, also um, about what we can build on top, how we can use it uh, as a, as a uh, tool for building intelligent data apps in RHEL using reasoning and probabilistic modeling. And probably already there's one term up here you haven't heard before. Uh, the language RHEL is uh, as a declarative database language that um, is, is the, the tool that allows us to do um, the reasoning and probabilistic modeling really in database. So we're going to be covering a lot of that um, in this talk. So first, a little bit more about our, our company. Um, Relational AI was uh, founded in 2017 um, as, a, as a from first principles cloud native platform. Um, we're recently out of stealth with our first enterprise customers. Um, we uh, are, are really a, a strongly mission driven team. We have a strong concept of, of, of a very new kind of product and I, and I hope to introduce you to that today. Um, uh, we, we also have a very active board of directors, a lot of people behind us who are very passionate about, about uh, seeing, seeing this product succeed. So it's, it's a very exciting time for us um, to, to be involved. Uh, I, I won't go into this full slide, but you know we're HQ'd in, in Berkeley. We've been fully remote from the start, so uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful collaborative atmosphere that uh, is, happens uh, mostly online. And so uh, we are in the cloud ourselves, so to speak. We have over 50 PhDs uh, at Relational, um, 2000 plus publications, 100K plus citations, uh, 37 awards and counting. So we've always kept very close uh, to our academic roots. And um, uh, I think you'll, you'll see that today. So first of all, what we are building at Relational AI. Um, as I said, it's a cloud native relational database platform designed for structured and semi-structured dynamic data and with the data and application logic together in one place. So this is basically my outline. <laughs> this is where we're going to start is, uh, oh, what do I mean uh, by, by these three things? Um, and, and this is, this is almost uh, the full outline. So then we're going to have some fun and get into um, examples of intelligent data applications uh, built on the RKGMS with, with the language rel. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the future of what intelligent databases are and what we see them looking like. But let's start here. Let's start with what motivates us. Um, so we are a cloud native relational database platform. Um, and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the motivation for, for building this thing, you know, and a little bit about how it's architected. So first of all, our motivation. This drawing here is supposed to represent uh, something like the modern data stack. Okay. Um, what, what makes it really modern is that you have this um, cloud data platform. I don't know if folks can see my mouse when I do this. I think so. Um, so so a cloud data platform um, at its core that is um, able to, to separate data from engines, so from compute power. Um, you can scale up and scale out as needed uh, for the application at hand. And now um, for the, the first time, all of your, your data apps, your BI tools, um, everything that would traditionally uh, have its own small database, uh, specialized database, can now access the, the broad swath of data available um, all in, with one source of truth, so in, in one location. And this is very powerful. So now your data apps um, are, are communicating with the same source, uh, same source data at the same um, ground truth, and uh, and you can sort of build on top of that. Um, this is great, but there are some uh, uh, division here that makes the process not quite um, uh, smooth. So you have uh, data apps, you have ML tools, you have uh, BI tools that are written a very procedural or navigational, like a graph database kind of way, or procedural um, uh, uh, calculation kind of way, versus your database, which is declarative. Um, to date, these applications, these other tools, which contain all of the logic that's related um, to your data, 
are, are not cloud native. So they don't scale out the same way that the underlying data does. So you can't work at the same scale um, that, your, that your data really is. And you miss out on, on things because of that, on insights. Um, there's also other advantages that you get uh, from the cloud data platform side that don't translate into the application. So um, data sharing, uh, uh, versioning, time travel, zero copy cloning, these advantages where you can really um, iterate on your data uh, uh, in the database, but not in, in the logic layer. So what we see our platform doing is complementing um, the, the cloud data platforms that are out there now. Um, doesn't really matter which one they all offer very um, similar features um, and we extend those to new workloads right so we bring in uh, more data science more data applications we bring in graph analytics json analytics um, relational application logic so so knowledge uh, and, and semantics in in the uh, database prescript predictive and prescriptive analytics um, all of that can now uh, with our platform be, be brought into the the cloud native uh, layer and be done at scale Key to this, key to achieving these uh, uh, new workloads is, is this idea of having a semantic layer, a semantic model built on top of the database, okay? Um, so, so now instead of just directly in, uh, uh, integrating with your, your data in a set of tables um, in, the, in the cloud, you have some, some reasoning uh, model attached on top, some, some way of, um, of uh, contextualizing your data that, that is also a single source of truth across data apps. So let me explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Okay, so so we have the semantic reasoning uh, and, and semantic model layer on top of the data. Um, uh, this this also shares the advantages of the, the data sharing, the versioning, the, the time travel, zero copy cloning. But what is it? I'm going to explain it with, through an example. Uh, and this is an example that's going to show up uh, over the course of, of, our, of our little uh, mini lecture here. Uh, it's a flight data, um, um, it's intelligent data app, okay? Uh, and the applications for, for such an app might be something like tracking performance of carriers, airports, aircraft models, individual aircraft. You can discover relationships between uh, seasons or time of day and weather delays, uh, planning and optimization of routes, uh, looking at historical trends. Um, if it's live, you can act on the issues as they're arising. So so this is sort of the, the sort of environment we're going to uh, contextualize our, our introduction to the system around is this, this flight data application. Now let's look at how this kind of data would look in a traditional SQL database, right? So you have tables such as this one that talk about the, the flight, details about the flights, uh, carriers, origin, destination, you know. Um, but, but quickly you see that there, you're missing context Right. So, so what is the primary key for this table? Um, when I'm given data like this, a flight time, is this hours? Is this minutes? What is this? Um, it turns out this data set includes helicopters, but that's not at all clear from from just looking at the um, the flight numbers and and the origins destinations. You might be messing up aggregates if they're coming from your raw data. Uh, what does this mean for there to be a flight time of zero? Is that going to be correct if you start aggregating across? Uh, uh, data. Some things uh, are, are in columns that don't really apply. So you have an arrival to delay that's negative. That's not really a delay. You know, how is that going to affect your calculations? Um, again, periods that don't have any units attached to them. Um, are, are certain data points exclusive Boolean values? Canceled, diverted? Are these exclusive? What, is this, what does this mean? What are the possible values? Um, so, you, so you lose out on this context without that semantic layer on top. So we're going to uh, go back to this example later and add that in and show what that is going to look like. Um, right now, this reasoning layer uh, is now implemented procedurally, right? So you'll have this in your data app on top in languages like Java, C Sharp, Python, etc. Um, and you end up with this sort of split brain problem, right? Where the data is managed in one layer and the knowledge and semantics are, are really uh, separated from that. So, so fixing that will, will have a huge impact. It'll bring the app logic to the data, right? And with one single source of truth, um, and you'll be able to do it at scale across your entire data um, and drive insights across that, that full scope of your data. So in order to build this, this new platform, um, we had a few core requirements. Uh, those are, uh, first of all, scalability. You've got to separate data storage from compute. You have to be able to scale out the compute as needed for the application. 
data independence. So we want to separate the application logic from how it's represented from the data representation. Um, but we also want to keep the two side by side. So, so data and application logic together in one database in order to achieve semantic reasoning. We also want this to be performant, so we want to have a live programming environment. Um, so we need to be able to support things like incremental changes uh, to data and logic. There are six key innovations that are behind our product. Um, it, it's a lot to cover, and, and we absolutely will not be covering it all in this lecture. Um, I, I'm actually uh, going to touch on several of them, and, and Chef and Willa as well. So, so you'll you'll be seeing versions of this slide again show up when I say, ah, we're coming back to this. Um, but but we're not going to do a deep dive into these into these core innovations. What we're going to be focused on today is is what we can achieve with them, right? So having these things in place, what do they allow us to do? Uh, that and, and allows us to do for data apps. So that, that's the focus of this lecture. But if you want to learn more about the system, um, I am going to throw this up here. Please take a screenshot uh, and uh, in your own time, um, check out some of these, these lectures. So um, learning more about uh, the relation, the modern data stack, sorry, and how relational knowledge graphs fit into that. There's a nice talk by uh, Bob Lulia on our board. Um, our VP of Engineering, Martin, uh, gave a series of, of two great talks that, that really complement each other going into the uh, Rye system, so um, the, the RKGMS and, and, and how it works. So these two complement each other well. I recommend them in this order. Um, so the CMU Relational AI talk, if you Google that or YouTube search that, it'll come up. And then um, this uh, second talk, uh, the DSDSD <laughs> um, uh, database seminar on um, on algorithms for relational knowledge graphs. So both of these are, are excellent resources. Okay, so so that's that's what motivates us. That's what we're trying to build and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, let's talk a little bit um, briefly about about how the system's actually architected. So the architecture uh, of the plat database platform um, is really related to scalability, right? So that at its core, separating data storage from compute um, so that we can we can scale out our, our to whatever scale is necessary for um, the data at hand, right? Uh, so, so you have a, a layers that look something like this. You can do your app development in whatever resource you like, um, and then Via that resource, you're going to talk to uh, the RKGMS uh, through a Rye SDK. These are written currently in, in Python, Julia, uh, JS. I think we have a Next.js as well. Uh, Go, Java, C Sharp. Uh, growing list of languages um, for the Rye SDK. You can you can sort of uh, pick your poison there. Hi, there we go. Um, and uh, and in the cloud region, that's where we you communicate via our our services to a provisioned engine, um, and uh, the data itself lives in another layer in like durable object storage, so like S three or some some bucket. Um, and and in this way, you can really uh, pres provision engines and and uh, even have a serverless engine environment uh, the sort of plugs are in place for that um, as needed to, to scale your 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 solution so so the architecture here touches on one of these key innovations um, immutability this is really uh, critical for um, our, our uh, data storage, that it's the data and metadata are versioned and immutable. Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but I wanted to call it out. Um, and I wanted to also flash another slide up here. This is sort of a list of our, our influences and, and resources that are related to, to how we architect um, our, our storage management. And if this is a subject that's interesting you, uh, please take a screenshot and, and check out uh, uh, these, these resources. So, as far as, as how you communicate um, with the RKGMS, uh, I think in this talk we're going to focus mostly on the language RHEL, which is a relational database language de designed for semantic reasoning, designed for um, advanced application logic that we've designed to fill that gap in um, having a, a, re a truly uh, declarative relational language that, that handles these, these workloads. Um, but it's not not the only choice. So if for those more comfortable in SQL, uh, there, there's SQL support. Um, you can fully talk to the, the RKGMS via SQL. Um, we also support um, other uh, uh, semantic languages um, uh, like legend, and then we have plans for, for more in the future. Uh, 
feature language support. The data formats that we take in, um, currently we handle uh, structured data via CSVs and, and semi-structured JSON. Um, we have a couple other formats that we're supporting and, and many more on the horizon there. The, the uh, intermediate representation is a RHEL representation. That's how the data um, uh, lives inside the, um, the RKGMS and, and how we, the, it's the layer on top of which we construct all of our uh, query optimization and, and, and logic um, and, and execution um, uh, uh, innovations on top of this. And then uh, at the core is what you saw before, the, the relational knowledge graph system architecture. So, so just quickly to kind of walk through the steps of how a transaction is executed. You have um, your your rel model or or your SQL query on top. Um, this is this is parsed. We go through a dependency analysis and a type inference phase. Um, we do specialization to first order logic, then a dependency analysis, semantic optimization, physical optimization, and then. Um, uh, evaluation, either a uh, vectorized and, and we have just in time uh, evaluation. Um, and uh, the the stages that it goes through uh, depend a bit on on how the the optimizer um, and, and the various other layers uh, handle the data. And each of these layers talks to um, a metadata database uh, built on uh, salsa and Julia. And um, this this is sort of our, our tool and our uh, for uh, maintaining incrementality in a live programming environment. I believe Salsa has now been open source too, as well. So that's that's available in the, in the Julia environment. Okay, so we've gotten through our first uh, outline bullet point already and, and look at the time, uh, still, uh, still so far to go. So we're building a cloud native relational data platform and hopefully you have some idea of, of what that means now. Um, so, so on to, to what it's designed to do. So it's designed for structured and semi-structured data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we implement that. So first of all, the what the relational model is and the paradigm and why, and why we uh, value it. Um, then we're talking about uh, in, in practice, what views on relations look like. And then we'll talk about the, the performance implications of our, of our implementation. So first of all, the relational model. Um, just want to really emphasize here. So the relational model um, represents all data using first order relations, okay? The purpose is to really have independence of application logic from changes in data representation, right? So this data independence is the central goal here and it's what the relational model was designed to achieve. Um, I want to call out that SQL is not the relational model, right? This is one implementation of the relational model. Um, and, I, and I call this out explicitly because the inadequacies of SQL are often mo used as motivation for, for some totally new um, uh, data models. And it's really the relational paradigm um, is sound. It is uh, really that we need to go, go beyond SQL in the implementation to, to get the other um, features that we need. So again, back to our core requirements, the slide will be flashing up a few times. Um, data independence uh, is really um, a core requirement. We want to be able to support changes in our data, additional data, new streams of data, um, uh, and, and not have our application logic need to be rewritten to accommodate that, right? So, so the application logic should, should be um, a layer on top and and not depend on the on, on the data streams that are that are being represented. So we we achieve data independence with Rye relations. Um, all data and logic is stored as Rye relations. So both data and logic are stored in the form of relations. Um, the the application at logic, yeah. I think I think these points say the same thing. Application logic is also written as declarative relations. It's relations all the way down. Uh, it's turtles all the way down. Um, tables and graphs, etc., are composed views over those relations. So, so what is a Rai relation? Well, they're not tables. Uh, relations you can think of more as, as the building blocks. They're the Legos. They're the, the basic unit you construct uh, your views out of, right? So they're the building blocks of tables, um, but they also enable many other views on data, graph, JSON, RDF, et cetera. 
relations are narrow. So I'm going back now to that flight example. Uh, uh, here's a, a sort of miniature version of a, of a flight table where we have carrier, flight number, origin, destination, and departure. So, so rather than store the data in this wide table view, we break it apart into narrow views on the data. So, so for each key, table key, we have, for instance, the departure information. And we do this uh, for, for all of the data. Um, for those who know, this is called sixth normal form, right? So, so RI relations are in sixth normal form, um, really just these, these key value pairs, single value pairs for each key. Um, and what does this, the, this narrow data structure uh, allow us to do? So, so the advantages are that um, they're extensible and dynamic. Um, you can add base data, for instance, uh, new base data. You can um, add derived logic. Uh, on the data without without touching your original uh, relations, your not tables anymore, but your relations, if you will. You don't need to touch them to to add logic on top. Um, you're you're free from nulls uh, in this representation. The data is either there or it isn't. Um, we do still support missing. That's different. Um, but but we don't we don't uh, uh, have to be a slave to nulls anymore. We can we can escape that. Um, and also they're composable. So, so by building with these Lego bricks, with these relational elements, we can create tables, subgraphs, and other views on our data. Okay, so what do views on relations actually look like? Uh, a table we've already kind of seen. So the composition of a table is sort of the opposite of what we just did of, of breaking it apart. Um, you, you, a, a view, a table view is composed of a, of a module of relations, um, all that share the same keys. Uh, a module is a, a, a rel concept um, that's basically a relation of relations. Okay, so, so we can group relations together under a single uh, umbrella as a single relation. Um, it's still relations all, all the way down. Um, and in our flight example, you might uh, visualize this this way, right? So uh, we have some, some table view that represents flight. Um, and within that uh, flight relation are, are a set of, of relations that might correspond to a table column, okay? And the, Let's see here. The way that we would query this um, is really uh, just as though as though that um, uh, semant that uh, semantic data that that um, um, uh, the the individual columns in a table view, if you will, are are just part of our key, right? So so we had this example of a carrier um, here for this flight. It's, it's Alaska Airlines, I believe that's AL. Um, and if we put this under the um, module of a, of a flight table, we would just simply um, query it this way. So we want the carrier, here's the flight, here's the value. Um, you could see the analogy here with the table view, right? So this relation flight has some uh, relation within a carrier. This is similar to a column. Um, and, and we have this, this key, which is similar to a table row, and our, our single value. We can also represent graphs as a view. Um, so, so a view, uh, a graph view is a composed of a set of GNF relations. So I'm gonna explain uh, in a second what GNF is. You've seen six NF. So now we're gonna talk about GNF, graph normal form. So going back to our uh, exploded view of our flight table, so this is a, a set of relations that, that comprise uh, our flight data. Um, you can see immediately the analogy here with a graph. So each of these binary relations, tuples in this relation, are equivalent to um, uh, data about an edge, right? So here we're connecting um, flights to their origin, their airport origin. Um, here we're connecting them to their destination. Departure connected to a time, flight number, uh, carrier, and so on. We can visualize these as a graph. So here they are sort of set up as a graph, um, where now we have these flight nodes uh, with many um, outgoing uh, edges that are connecting them to, to various data points, right? Um, I think I have the arrows here the wrong way, but you get the idea. The only thing that we're missing is 
the things and not strings, all right? So this is critical for a graph. Um, you don't simply want to connect uh, uh, contextless data. You need to add that context there, that, that semantic meaning. Um, that's what we call uh, the graph normal form, okay? So what does this mean in practice? This means in practice that we need annotated data. We need to know that AL can have the, the type of a carrier, all right, because you might imagine that that AL could also be uh, the code for a, a, a airport or, or some other kind of data. You want to distinguish these concepts, right? So we do that um, uh, by introducing this idea of graph normal form and things, not strings. And now we have separate concepts in place for uh, locations, for times, for flight numbers, and, and for carriers in this case. So here is a schema view of that graph I just showed you. So rather than um, uh, showing each individual node, I'm now showing the, the sort of schema level. So here's this concept of a flight that we are representing as numbers here. Um, uh, airports here in green, the date times for the departures and arrivals and so on, um, flight numbers and uh, as, as integers here, and then um, the, the carrier, the, the airline as well. How do we get to things from our strings? We have two ways of doing that in, in Rye. So uh, first of all, what is a thing? A thing, as I said, is it's this annotated data, right? That adds the semantic context that you're missing. Um, we do this in two ways. We can do this with what we call value types. So with a value type, you can go from, from data that's represented, say, as an integer um, to declaring a value type uh, called flight number, for instance. Um, and now all of those numbers that were were in there as simply integers now have a data type that's very explicit um, uh, to what it means, right? So it's a flight number. And as you'll see later, when we build that um, logic layer on top, we can uh, write relations that only ingest flight numbers, right? So it'll only return values over over flight numbers, um, as an example. Uh, so you can you can use those custom types that you've value types that you've created uh, in your logic. We also support entity types. Um, so for example, in this case, uh, a flight we've been just showing as, as integers before, but this isn't very robust, right? So if you bring in new data and you need to kind of keep track of, 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 uh, of a number that doesn't really have any context, this can be um, uh, very tricky. So what we want is we want to define a flight by the characteristics that make it unique, right? So what is the real primary key of that table? Um, we can define that by, by just telling uh, the system what, what are the, the important unique identifying features. So in this case, uh, the carrier, right, and the flight number, but also the day it departs. You might have the same uh, carrier with the same flight daily, for instance. Um, so with, but with this combination, um, you come at a, a unique representation for what a flight is and a unique key for flights in your, in your graph. So that's the important um, uh, element that we need to add uh, to get to graphs is this idea of things, not strings. And, and these are the tools that we have to do it. So here you're seeing it in a, a sort of um, pictorial form and, and later we're gonna show it uh, as code. So relational modding is literally a natural fit for graphs. I think if you take away uh, just one or two things uh, from this talk, I hope this is one of them, um, that, that the relational paradigm is, is really um, uh, ideally suited for, for graph and for graph applications. Uh, just as a, as a little aside here, so um, you might be more familiar, if you're familiar with graphs, seeing them as, as labeled property graphs. So this is a, a kind of graph where you can actually have um, properties on top of nodes and on top of edges. So in this case, um, the actor node has, has a name attribute associated with them. Um, this acted edge also has an attribute, this role that, that the actor played. Um, we can also represent this uh, in a, with the, the relational modeling, okay? So so we can represent nodes as these arity one or, or unary relations um, with the, the node identifiers. We can represent edges as I already showed you with the, the binary um, uh, relations. So here, um, the connection between a node and its um, attributes is just the same as any other edge, right? It's just gonna be a, a leaf edge. Um, and um, yeah, and so we can do this for, for all of the, the various nodes. We can also connect the nodes. So here, the directed um, and acted uh, edges connect node to node. 
And we can also uh, define edge attributes. So we can do that via uh, hyper edges. So, so this is not really um, uh, kosher with a, a labeled property graph um, diagram as, as it's shown here, but it's no problem with a relational model, right? So we can simply connect, um, in this case, this actor node, node one, with the movie node, um, uh, node three, Dune, um, and and up, up and add the role. Uh, so here that he played uh, this this character. Paul, and I'm not going to try and pronounce that last name. I haven't seen June yet. Uh, Paul Atreides. Uh, okay, so so that's graphs. Uh, onward. So we can we don't just uh, uh, have the ability to ingest structured data, right? We can also uh, ingest semi-structured data. Uh, we support JSON, for instance, uh, JSON analytics. So um, uh, JSON in the Riot platform is a view composed of modularized relations. So it's uh, it's a little bit uh, similar. To, to a table, so, so let's see how that actually looks in practice. So in Rye, um, we represent JSON again as a series of first order relations, they're in graph normal form. Um, and the way we can sort of get there is by by imagining, you know, um, the the JSON tr as a tree, right? The, the, it's typically represented as a tree after parsing, okay? So here for this idea of, of, a, of a JSON, um, uh, data representing a contact, um, we can break it down uh, as, as a tree like this, okay? So let's recompose this tree more in a relational kind of look. Um, in this case, the, the green cells here are the internal nodes of the tree, and the gray cells are the leaves, right? So that's the actual data. When we break this up, um, and immediately you can see what this looks like as a set of relations, okay? So the the green um, uh, prefixes again are the become the keys to the data right so for each row here each tuple um, you have a, a set of green keys and then you have single valued data so we're in we're in six normal form and each of these is, is unique and so uh, it's it's really achieves this this graph normal form uh, you can break these out right this is the same way we were talking about with tables so so we um, actually uh, specialize, we call it specialization, um, the the keys as as relations themselves, okay? So um, this allows us to ex uh, distinguish schema from data and it helps uh, as, as we um, uh, evaluate, so it helps us performance-wise to, to distinguish these as separate relations. Um, we also do, uh, we maintain sort of, um, an internal physical representation that, that we do some reordering on to really distinguish the, the schema side um, and the metadata side from the from the data side. So um, here I'm showing you the, the internal sort of physical representation of, of phone uh, numbers where we've where we've reordered um, this this list information uh, into the data. Uh, but this doesn't actually impact anything that the user would experience. So you you still query via the logical representation, you would still sort of um, uh, use this key order to, to access your data. So it'll feel very much like a like a JSON document. And uh, generally, what we recommend is once once you've ingested your JSON in this form, the the next um, step is is really doing some some schema mapping on top right so so breaking out this data into um into gnf uh, relations into narrow gnf relations single key so i've shown you now how we can uh use the relational model and use what we call these rye relations these the uh, six normal form graph normal form relations um to compose many different views of our data to ingest structured and semi-structured data um and that this allows us to achieve uh, data independence where we can we can uh, extend our data, we can add to our data and, and our application logic is, is allowed to just sort of sit freely on top of that. Um, and it doesn't uh, need to expect any sort of changes to, to table structures or things like that. If narrow relations though are so great, why aren't they the standard already? Why doesn't SQL work this way? Um, and, the, and the answer is simple, it's, it's performance. Joins are hard. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why joins are hard and how, and how we make them less hard, right? So how we are able to actually do this. Um, so, so, so this is, this is hitting on performance. Okay. And, um, actually this hits on two of our key innovations. So, so join algorithms, the algorithms that, uh, we implement these, these newer, um, algorithms, uh, that allow us to, to achieve, 
um, uh, the performance that we need, and also the the details of the implementation. So being able to um, uh, compile complex joins down a native code using a vectorized engine for simpler joins, making that decision about when to do those cases is, is a system um, innovation uh, that I actually won't get into uh, right now, but I do want to spend at least um, a few minutes talking about uh, join algorithms. All right. So uh, knowledge graphs, they need different join algorithms. They need di uh, join algorithms that are, are different from the standard uh, in, uh, SQL based algorithms. So in a SQL based relational database, uh, typically the algorithms are binary join algorithms. OK, um, but for knowledge graphs, the intermediate results that these binary algorithms will produce are just just too large. So let me go through an example of that. OK, so let's say we have a query where we want to find um, uh, a child who acted in a movie that was directed by their parent. Let's let's call out some nepotism here. Um, so so we have three edges that are at play uh, the directed the relationship between the director and the movie. We have child the relationship between the director or, or parent in general person and the um, and the actor itself themselves and acted in so so an actor that actually plays a role in a movie okay um, and you can see that this is this is a, a sort of triangle graph pattern here any of the binary joins that we might choose to do um, sequentially for for a, a typical binary join algorithm are going to be um, awful so uh you can imagine we we join on uh directed and child well that's not selective most directors have children okay so then we select directed and acted in okay well that's not selective every movie has a director and has actors okay um again the the child relationship um and acted in it's not selective really every child has parents okay um and so so this is one of, of the, the many reasons that um that you have the stigma that that joins that joins are bad, okay? And why um, in SQL you do as much uh, sort of pre-joining as possible in, in constructing these tables. Um, so so we get around this with a set of worst case optimal join algorithms. Um, these are a new class of algorithms. Um, a lot of their properties and trade-offs are are not yet fully understood. So it's 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 very interesting to be at the forefront of of these uh, technologies and these techniques. Um, we implement um, the leapfrog tri join, generic join, dovetail join. Those are some of the the. Um, uh, worst case optimal join algorithms that that we that we implement. Um, and we sort of look at their properties from three angles, okay? So first of all, the benefit of one of these algorithms is that they uh, exploit the sparsity in the data. So they actually take advantage of that um, uh, to achieve um, performance. We also um, look at recasting the subquery problem and we embrace uh, correlation. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and we also recast the index selection problem. So let's, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to cover these at sort of a, a high level. And um, that slide I showed you before with, with other talks kind of d dives deeper in if, if, if this is interesting to you. Okay. So let's talk about sparsity. All right. So we're going to uh, construct a query where we look for um, a female Asian director that is an Oscar winner. Okay, uh, it turns out there's one, <laughs> so so very sparse uh, uh, data. Um, so so first we can um, seek uh, for female, and and we can seek across Asian, and we see that there's big gaps here, right? So this allows us to, if we we do, could do this with the worst case optimal join algorithm, to do this together and to to make fewer hops because because we're hopping across. Um, uh, these gaps. Okay. And uh, again, not going to go into the details, but you can see, at least in this case, we, we only do really seven hops um, before we land on, on that one uh, solution. Okay. So they use this sparsity in, in each of the relations to, to narrow down uh, the overall search. Okay, now the subquery problem. All right, so there's two really um, uh, undesirable approaches to, to handle um, subqueries, right? Uh, SQL systems will attempt to, to rewrite uh, and decorrelate uh, to, to, avoid, to avoid these. Um, and the, the first approach is uh, uh, top down, right? So you imagine that for, for each row in your, in your main query, you uh, execute the subquery. Um, but, but this could um, uh, 
really, really be time consuming, right? And then um, the bottom up, you over compute, right? So you compute the subquery for everything and then and then sort of filter with the outer query. Um, but this this is also uh, potentially going to, to blow up on you, right? So um, we address subqueries uh, with two powerful and, and general methods. The first is um, we identify uncorrelated subqueries uh, with the semantic optimizer and, and handle those. So, so this is something we'll talk about uh, in more detail later in the talk, but it comes up here. Um, we also embrace the correlation. So uh, when there is correlations, we can use worst case optimal joins um, as a, a sort of correlated join uh, device, right? As, as I showed you before. So we also recast the, the index selection problem. So index selection uh, to auto-tuning, this is a, an open and unsolved problem, all right? But we, we decided from the very start, we don't want users to have to deal with it, okay? They should not have to be asked to manually define indexes um, or supervise, you know, tuning approaches, um, uh, anything like that. So we want this to feel very just um, uh, auto-magical. So you declare what you want and the system does what it needs to do. So uh, in order to achieve this, uh, everything is an index in our graph-like schemas. So um, you can compare this with RDF triple stores that create indexes for all orderings or uh, SQL tables. They store an index for every functional dependency, all right? But we store an index for, for everything. And uh, with these worst case optimal joins, it's a device where we can create these composite indexes on the fly and we can do it cheaply um, without uh, affecting uh, the performance. So uh, what does that look like? So creating these um, uh, uh, indices. So for example, I have a, a mini graph here where we have um, a connection between cars. I'm representing those numerically with their brand and with their model. So here we have one car that's a Ford Escape. We have another car here that's a Jeep Cherokee. Um, if we think of this as our relation in our relational building box, we have um, relations like these, right? Uh, and we decompose these into our index building blocks. So, so really every permutation. So um, key value, key value, value key, value key, and so on for both brand and model uh, relations. And then uh, we can break these up into every combination of, of index uh, and do this without sorting. So, so this is what we're what, what these um, algorithms allow us to, to have access to uh, as needed. If you're interested in join algorithms and want to learn more about the the join algorithms that uh, at a deeper level the join algorithms that we um, uh, uh, employ uh, check out these papers uh, these are our sort of influences the influential papers uh, that motivated us and uh, keep it up for a sec for for grabbing a screenshot okay Okay, so so now we're getting to, to data and application logic uh, together in one place. We've covered what we're building, a cloud-native relational data platform. Um, we've talked about that it's designed for structured and semi-structured dynamic data, and uh, that it brings the data and application logic really together in one place. Uh, that's what we're going to cover now. <laughs> and I think I'm doing well on time. Uh, so I think I'll, I'm able to continue, but maybe before we dive into this section, um, I can I can take a, a very brief pause. Is there is there anything that that uh, folks questions folks have or, or anything anyone wants to talk about uh, before I continue? We've been going hard for for 47 minutes, and I thought this would take at least a, an hour. So that tells me I'm speaking a little quickly. So I want to make sure that I'm I'm not uh, rushing you along here. Uh, but okay. I am not sure uh, uh, if the uh, uh, participants uh, uh, are allowed to. Oh, okay. All right. No, that's fine uh, then. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, Kumar, are you there? Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, they can ask you directly. Yes, right. yes I am there. Oh, okay. Yes, All right. Here. Okay, so everybody can uh, use the microphone here to, to pose a question, not necessarily on the chat. That's right. Okay. All right. right. Okay, if someone uh, wants to ask a question, I mean, it's uh, maybe a good time to, to ask a question. Uh, yeah. Ask. Let's see. If not, we'll, we'll forge ahead. There we go. 
All right, uh, onwards and upward. So uh, we're gonna we've we've covered that uh, uh, what we're building. So this cloud native relational database platform, um, it's designed for for structured and strong semi structured dynamic data. And I hope I've I've sort of illustrated that for you. Um, and now we're gonna talk about uh, application logic. So so we're gonna store our data and application logic really together in one place. Okay. And what does that look like? So this is all around our core requirement of, of supporting semantic reasoning, okay? That, that we have uh, one source of truth for also our semantic layer on top of our data, okay? So I'm gonna break this, this section up into really uh, uh, four uh, sections. So we're gonna talk a bit about the semantic layer, a little bit more on what we mean by that. Uh, then we're gonna introduce the rel language. Um, and then we're going to get back to our, our flight uh, application example uh, and talk about that as a, as a use case with really bringing in that, the, that app application logic uh, into, the, into the data. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit more about performance, so, so the, the tools that allow us uh, to, to do this in a, in a performant way. Okay, but first the semantic layer. So... You've already seen uh, this slide. Um, part of our, our proposition is that we really want to um, make the semantic understanding um, of the data part of the database. So, so where where those two things are are tied together, and really um, that uh, you you attach the semantic meaning directly to your data rather than having it sit separately in in separate data apps, right? And you can see how this might be. Um, a, a, a risk um, when your application logic is, is really separated from your data, right? So you can imagine having definitions, for instance, of concepts that, that might be different across different um, uh, apps and across different sort of uh, access, access points. And, and this can lead to, to con data confusion. You, you also um, aren't able to, to really um, build logic across your full set of data, the, your, your sort of, um, that cloud scale terabyte plus uh, uh, data because you just can't really do that in, in apps that aren't cloud native, okay? So by b bringing these, uh, this sort of reasoning um, into, into the, the data, uh, the database, you're able to, to achieve these things. Okay, um, so so there's uh, various approaches out there to semantic modeling. Um, some of them are SQL based. So, for instance, uh, DBT very recently announced um, that they want to tackle a SQL based approach with the later, latest round of funding. Their big cells they want to tackle a SQL based approach um, to to building that semantic layer, right? Um, uh, Malloy, so so uh, Google and Looker, it's a proposal to succeed Look ML and Maps. To SQL. Um, there's open industry-based solutions out there. So Legend uh, by Goldman Sachs, this is a, a UML plus OCL kind of inspired approach. It also runs on SQL. Uh, we also support Legend actually. So you can you can put uh, the, the Legend semantic layer on top of um, Rye as well. So uh, Morphier is uh, another approach by Morgan Stanley. So this is a functional programming based approach and uh, it runs on Spark. Um, and then there's certain um, sort of just standard-based, uh, of course, approaches. So um, the SBVR, um, semantic business vocabulary and rules, um, and the, the semantic web, of course. So this is the W3C uh, standard, Sparkle, RDF, OWL, Shackle, all those. Um, and and so so you can see that the 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 it's a timely uh, sort of uh, interest uh, across across the board to to bring the semantic modeling uh, to the data, um, and uh, uh, what the the in the way that we think of it is that we really need to um, to really redesign this um, uh, from the ground up, really with um, uh, breaking free of the of the SQL uh, mold, so that we can we can do this in a performant way. Um, the semantic layer uh, is, so, so let's go through an example. Let's go through an example to talk about what the semantic layer really is. Uh, going back to our, our flight uh, tracking database, okay? So let's, let's think about some example functionality that we might want to have. All right. So, for example, how many transfers uh, would I need to travel between two cities? Maybe I want to ask that question. Um, what percentage of flights were delayed this year uh, per airline? Okay. Um, if a percentage of flights arrive delayed to an airport per day, should I, you know, can I send an alert? Can I trigger off of events? Um, the system 
can't answer these questions if they don't know what these concepts mean. So this, this concept of delay, this concept of transfer, what, what are they, right? So we want to build that application layer that defines these things, and we want to bring it into the database and have it really um, uh, uh, dynamically um, populate these, these concepts as, as our data uh, changes and updates, okay? Uh, on demand, we want to be able to do this on demand. Um, so, so let's answer some of these questions, right? So we can define uh, what a canceled flight is. This is for a flight, um, and if it if it has a certain field as as marked yes in the in our data, then uh, this flight canceled edge uh, leads to to yes, then that means that it's, it's canceled. So we can we can define a subset of flights that are canceled. We can do similar for diverted. It also um, comes from our source of truth data. We can also impose requirements. Uh, we can we can complete this this uh, triad of of statuses for flights by saying a flight is marked arrived if it's a flight and it's not canceled and it's not diverted, right? So this this is purely coming from the logic. This is uh, the layer. This is really a layer on top. So this isn't uh, defined anywhere in our source data, but we we create this concept um, and populate it based on on lo the logic of our data. Okay. Um, we can also uh, contextualize sort of um, the data with um, with values. So the arrival delay, um, it's it's going to be uh, a maximum of zero. So those negative delays aren't really delays. So we're not going to, to populate from those. Um, and uh, if, if it's a positive delay, then we're gonna take it uh, from our data here and we're going to give it the type of, of minute, okay? Um, we can ask to questions over these uh, well-defined concepts. We can count, for instance, canceled flights. Um, we can find the mean of arrival delay and find out the mean arrival delay. We can um, do the, the same thing by carrier. So for each carrier, give me that mean um, arrival delay. Okay, and we do this in a declarative way. So we tell it what we want it to return um, and, it, and it does it for us. Um, calculation. All right, so we've already sort of introduced an example of the rel language in this in this uh, case here. So all of this is rel, uh, but now we're going to dig a little deeper into the rel language and uh, and what the capabilities are. So this is again one of our key innovations coming back to the slide, and this is the one that we're going to explore in the most detail in this talk. So rel in a nutshell, rel is uh, designed to to handle um, this designed for semantic modeling and querying. It's designed to express complex business logic. Um, it's able to handle structured and semi-structured data, as you've already seen. Um, it's a natural fit for graph use cases because it promotes this graph normal form. Um, it's readable uh, for business users. I hope you'll see that. Um, it's, it's fairly easy for developers to pick up. Um, it's also very expressive. It, it's quite concise and, and extensible. So data log. Data log is a, a great foundation. Um, and actually, uh, you could think of uh, data log as the, the internal representation, uh, the intermediate representation for, for REL. Um, so the good about data log, it has an outstanding uh, formal foundation. Um, mutual, supports mutually recursive definitions. Um, but but more is needed. Data log's not enough, right? So um, classic data log, so globally stratified, uh, is really too limited for graph workloads. You can't do um, value creation, aggregation, negation, and recursion. These are really required to do graph analytics. Data log does not support um, abstraction. So this is similar to, to SQL, Cypher, Sparkle, et cetera. Um, you, you want to be able to abstract over concrete relations and, and especially abstract over schema. So we'll show you how we can we can achieve this in realm. We can do this in realm. So so here is what uh, a relation at its core looks like. You have a relation definition. It has some key and it has a single value. So data and logic are all are both organized uh, with relations. Okay. Um, you have declarative logic, right? So this first order logic, uh, really based on on data log, um, as the sort of spiritual founder, um, it's a principled way to express uh, data manipulations and, and queries. So here we have an example um, of inserting some some data. We're inserting into this parent relation from load CSV. Um, here's an example of uh, 
inserting logic or sorry installing logic so uh, you can define a concept like a grandparent um, and here this grandparent exists um, if for, for a person yz um, if the parent of, of x is y and the parent of y is z so so then you you have this x as a grandparent Uh, well, supports abstraction. So um, there's a concise uh, expression of knowledge. Um, you could express uh, paths naturally, right? So here is a, is a recursive example of, of how you can um, de define reachable um, using using this um, uh, dot or composition syntax. Um, there, it's we support higher order logic. So expressing um, complex business logic is reusable components. So here I've created two definitions, the mean, which is uh, over some relation. So I can pass in this higher order relation um, and do the sum over it and the count over it and return the mean. Um, similarly with the, the arg max, I can return the, the using that, that composition to dex, I can return the arg max. We support recursion, so so this is critical for ex to expressing complex business logic, um, and uh, we support non-stratified logic. So that means we support negation, we support aggregation. Um, here's an example of that this is the PageRank algorithm in RHEL. So uh, you can see that we have our, our sort of base definition here, and then our recursive definition on top, which actually. Uh, oh, I can't click on that. <laughs> which actually invokes PageRank. Um, and 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 does a, a sum as well. So you can see that this is this is uh, non-certified logic here. Um, we support integrity constraints. So you can declare um, integrity constraints uh, and and validate and enforce logical consistency of your data. Right. So you can declare that that. Um, uh, data can be, for example, transitive, right? Here, so here's an integrity constraint checking that uh, the transitive property. Um, you you can check that that certain um, uh, people or, or objects are older, you know, and and this should imply that. So, for in this case, that if person one is older than person two, and person two is older than person three, then it should be that uh, person one is older than person three, right? So, so logic like this. Um, you can uh, enforce functional dependencies. You can enforce types. So here we're we're ensuring um, that uh, uh, if if a if a value is in a in a relation, then it's a string. Okay, um, you can you can enforce things like this. Modules, modules. You've already been introduced to more in a sort of uh, uh, pictorial representation. Here's what modules look like in RHEL. So these are um, uh, an organization of application logic. It's a relation of relations. Um, and and what modules enable, they enable um, also an ecosystem of libraries. So if you combine these with higher order relations, now you can imagine having libraries where you pass in relations and, and can do um, have reusable sort of logic over those relations. Um, you can also have, have uh, custom, custom modules that you, you can query. So, so in, for instance, here I have some sample data and I, I want to get some stats out of it. So I, I um, calculate the average over the data. So here's the higher order relation average. I calculate the sum over the data and I can gather these together in a, in a module about my data and, and then query it like as such. So here I'm querying stats and this relation my average. I could also write this, you know, um, using uh, brackets and 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 sort of treating my average as as a as a key, um, so the 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 sort of uh, way of thinking about these feels feels very natural, um, and the way of of sort of uh, querying into into relations and into modules feels very much like querying keys and values. I can do schema abstraction, so schema and data are both first class citizens. Um, as you you saw the the example um, here that I'm I'm treating sort of I can treat my um, my uh, uh, relation as a as a key itself I can do that here to pull out schema information so here I want I have some um, relation uh, uh, unary relation uh, in a in a graph module say called stats I have some node names and I want to pull out or no here I'm using this example I think so you can do this also for graphs um, so let's say for my module stats right I want to know what are the relations that are inside my module stats so I query out okay stats I have the name in this case this example I was querying out my average
seem to have lost the casino. Same problem here. Uh, then I'll then I'll come back to this. Thank you. Okay, so so onwards with the the rel key aspect. So, um, you've already seen modules. I've already introduced this sort of in a pictorial way, but now I'm going to present it uh, in rel. What it really looks like in rel. Um, so so modules allow you to organize your application logic, right? So you can you can treat it sort of as a as a way to create namespaces. It's more than that, but that that's sort of one way of of thinking about it. Um, and what modules uh, can enable then is really an ecosystem of libraries. So if you combine modules with higher order logic, now you can imagine a set of um, reusable relations where you can pass in other full relations and do or multiple and do uh, computations over them. Okay, so this is how we construct our standard library so our standard library is uh, rel is written in rel so so we have a, a set of standard library relations um you you saw uh, an example here before where we have the definition of mean and argmax right are, are written in rel so we can support libraries of these uh using modules um you can also support uh, uh custom modules that allow you to sort of delineate your application logic. So here I'm showing a toy example where I have some data, right? And I define a module stats, uh, which gives me some, some aggregations over that data. Okay, so here I have my average. It's a relation that, that computes the average and my sum, a relation that computes the sum. Okay, and the way that I would query this, so I would query it uh, just the same as I would um, a, a set of keys for a relation stats, right? So here I could have put these square brackets uh, around here, but but you can leave them off in rel. And so here I'm I'm querying just um, the relation my average inside of the module uh, stats. Okay. We can also, because we, we sort of set things up to treat uh, uh, schema and data uh, on equal footing. So here, again, it's both, I'm, I'm able to query in as, as sort of like as a key, um, the, the relations. Um, you could do that, you can use that as a tool to do schema abstraction. Okay, so let me show an example of that. So here I'm, I'm wanting to pull schema information about my module stats. So I say, okay, for, for stats, pull out all of the relation names. Okay, and I don't care about about their value, but pull out the names um, as long as that name is not my average. Okay, so give me everything else that, that stats has. And if I query this, what I'll get out is I'll get out um, my average. Excuse me, or sorry, my sum. I'll get out my sum. Uh, so now I can see what are the the relations that are in my module. So I've just done a, a, a sort of um, a, uh, query over my schema and I did it the exact same way I would have done it had name not been a relation but been some sort of data um, in a in a binary relation stats okay so really there's this equal treatment of of schema and data uh, which allows us to to do this so easily all right so then uh, onward to to uh, schema list modeling um, so so schema list modeling um, uh, is uh, related to our support for for sort of overloading relations okay so we can focus on the application logic and not really on the the particular schema at least in the front end okay but still in the back end we support um, a type stable um, database okay so let me show you a, a, a little example of that to example here i've created a definition for pi i've created it using many different types so here i have a string here i have a single character integer, float, uh, decimal, fixed decimal, irrational. These are all um, numeric and string types that we support um, in, in RHEL. And I've overloaded this definition. So if I were to query this, if I were to just look at it in the, in the logical view, I would see a single relation with mixed types, right? So I have um, uh, characters, I have uh, the strings, I have my, my different data types, okay, my different numeric types. Um, but in the back end, in the physical view, What's really happened is that we've we've now um, separated these out into separate relations. So I have one string relation pi, I have one character relation pi, um, I have a rational and and so on definitions of pi. And um, by by having this separated out, I can then write other logic that maybe only pulls one or the other, that only pulls matching types, for instance, um, so that I can do uh, uh, rational, let's say, um, algebra 
or I could do float point, floating point algebra, um, depending on on the, the the application logic. But I don't need to worry about it with Pi. I can just invoke Pi, um, and it'll it'll be there. Um, I've already also touched on our support for entity and value types. Uh, here you can see examples of how we declare those. Okay, so remember that recall that entity and value types are are central and key for our support of this graph normal form, right? So taking um, data that lacks uh, any sort of um, uh, semantic understanding around it and really making it a, a thing. Okay, so so annotating it in a way that indicates what that data represents. Okay. Um, we can uh, support through value types, abstract user defined uh, data types, essentially. So here um, is an example with with a definition of hour and minute. OK, so I have some uh, declaration that um, uh, an hour has to be an integer and it has to be within this range. Um, and then if I pass in any integer that that uh, qualifies that that's an integer and it is within this range then it'll give me back out um, that number but but as a as an hour type okay so hour four hour six and so on similarly with minutes right um, and now I can construct higher order sort of date time relations um, which is which is always fun <laughs> to, to support uh, date times uh, thoroughly so now I can construct a sense of a time as an hour and a minute for instance or a time interval um, which is uh, takes in uh, two different times okay and I can build these things on top of each other um, entity types are, are um, a similar tool in the sense that they allow you to construct um, these sort of unique uh, keys, um, but entity types are actually all um, uh, have a value type that's that's all hashes, right? So it allows you to pass in um, a unique set of data and get out like a single um, element that's going to be a, a unique identifier uh, and is a deterministic unique identifier, okay? Um, and I think I showed you a visual example of that before with the flights. So, so these two together really um, enable a very expressive ontology and encoding of semantic meaning um, in our data. And they really make that, that GNF idea possible. Um, we also support uh, specialization. So you actually already saw a, a bit of an example of this with the pi. Um, we can uh, take a, a relation and um, uh, we can turn data into a uh, schema, okay? So so here, um, so you, what you saw before was an example of how we overload relations. So here I'm gonna show you how you can construct that yourself um, with, with constructing your own um, specialized uh, data. So here we, we have a sort of a fun example about um, platforms, uh, train platforms, and what are allowed, who are allowed on the train platforms. So uh, for example, we could take the string and specialize it um, into a type. So it's platform 1A, it's muggles. Um, we have an integer here, platform 2, muggles. Um, and here we have uh, a sort of, uh, actually an algebraic expression here, 9 plus 3 quarters. And this one allows wizards and witches. Um, it's a very practical example here. Um, and we see if we look at the the uh, the physical representation, we've actually created three relations, right? So we've specialized um, uh, these values. And now we have a relation one a, a relation that's a that's an integer type, right? And a relation that's this float type. But these are now schema. They're they're saved as schema, really, in our database rather than as data, um, which is uh, important for for how we um, actually query over it under under the hood. Okay. All right. So um, yeah. So so here you're saying that you have this type one uh, a this relation one a and then a string that's the muggles and then this this special relation two and the special relation that's a that's a float. We also support, oh, Stefan, you've joined us. Hey, uh, I'm actually, I've bled into his part of the talk um, uh, because he had to step out to, to take our, our children to school. It's actually bright and early for us here in the US. Um, did you want to start uh, taking over, Stefan? Are you ready? Oh, I mean, it's two more slides and then I'll probably take a break and then I'll. That sounds yeah. great. Let's organize it that way then. All right, so I'm just gonna finish up on the, the language key aspects. So, um, Another thing we support is uh, native transaction control. Um, so, so using um, relations uh, instead of keywords and, and being able to um, entangle 
application logic with, with transaction logic. So you can really do a lot of your transaction logic also uh, in database. So what is an example of that? What does that mean? Um, so for instance, let's say I, I want to um, insert into a log and I want to insert um, some timestamp, some, some sort of label and, and a value. Um, I, can, I can actually write that um, uh, in database. I can, um, and, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so then I can, sorry, um, I can write that in, uh, in, in the database and, um, and, and do an insert. And you can see here I even have, um, I've used insert in the definition um, of this value, um, or sorry, of this, of this log value. Um, and then here with, with the def output, I can query that as well in the same transaction. We can also do reflective modeling. So here um, we have an example of, of self-modifying logic. You can write rel in rel and then install it. So you can write your logic with rel and then and then install it as logic and have it execute. Okay. So um, this enables some some fairly novel um, package management and some some really dynamic um, uh, uh, model development, okay? Um, it's also a good tool for, for code introspection um, and it makes RHEL very extensible. So let me just show you a kind of trivial example of that. Um, all of our, our models are installed, okay? And, and then they are um, updated on top of the data uh, incrementally, okay? So, and they all have some, some sort of uh, name associated with them. So here I'm defining a model, I'm calling it model one, um, and I'm writing uh, as a string some rel code. So here uh, the definition of the relation foo is just, just has the value one, okay? Um, I can do that, I can do an insert into the, into the rel catalog of this model, and then I can query it. Right, so now I'm querying um, in the same transaction again uh, the output of foo, and I'll and I'll see that it's it's one. I'll, I'll get my data back out. So you can imagine this is a quite trivial example, but you can imagine using your application uh, data to construct relations that you then install as well. So so you can have this um, uh, self-modifying behavior. So summarizing. Now, there's a lot covered here, okay? So, but I hope you can see um, why why supporting all of these various features um, really required us to step back and 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 really do this from from um, from first uh, principles, right? Really come back and, and create a new language. Um, we've we've gone uh, we have as our roots sort of this data log idea um, of of first order logic, but we've really gone beyond that um, to support fully featured applications and really being able to um, construct them uh, in in database um, and uh, and and support them and query them and so on. So we support uh, relational logic. It's all declarative logic. Um, uh, we support higher order logic. We support recursion and, and including um, uh, non monotonic recursion, including aggregations, including negation. Um, we support uh, abstraction. We support schema abstraction and schemaless modeling. Uh, you've seen we support modules um, and, and this, this sort of capability um, um, to use, uh, uh, to, to access schema and, and data really on the same level. Um, we support integrity constraints. Uh, we support entity and value types and, and these key ingredients for, for doing the graph normal form. Uh, we support specialization. We support, so turning data into schema, that's specialization, turning data into schema. We support native uh, transaction control and we support uh, reflective modeling. So uh, maybe now is the time uh, to take a pause, Stefan, what do you think? I think so. I go. Uh, so the second part of the talk will be a little bit more, uh, more, more application focused. So there will be a little bit more, more examples and so on, and and trying to see a little bit more of our system now and and, and well in, um, in 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 action. And yeah, now a big focus will be on really what you have seen so far. Uh, what uh, with all the key features that RHEL has, and um, seeing how they actually play out, and how they make things actually quite quite nice to express. So, but of course, we also um, since we are like um, a, a company, and we want to attract a lot of people, and we also we are like you know um, declarative languages or data log type of languages are not like the most um, commonplace language, and most people write they you know SQL, Python, and so on, and 
And um, so that way we want to make it for these people also easy to to use our system and maybe get, get the flavor for it. And then they see like, oh, that is cool. And then slowly like notch them and hey, if you want to do more than SQL, then you know, you know, you you can also learn well, but you do you don't really have to if you if you uh if you don't need to, especially again, like some of our key users are maybe BI people that um want to just build some 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 aggregation about some data that the data engineers and data scientists like develop and uh just to build up some some platforms and um and data tools so in that respect we're also actively working on um building a a, a layer or like a connection layer with, with sql where um we actually um uh, and, and that we do in uh, in close uh, collaboration with DuckDB. So uh, it's really uh, like what they're doing. And so we're basically using DuckDB and, and, and their SQL support and basically now uh, translating their um, the, the SQL queries that they have and and so on in in in, in well relations and and, and well uh, queries and then, then send them to our system. And so we are they are also more and more like planning also to. Um, support like uh, <clears throat> like fuse and so on and um and, and really trying to our goal is set to really fully cover um to, to support the entire uh, um querying specs of, of of the sql language so um and, and that respect you can if people want to use us maybe not because of the well ex expressiveness but maybe more like for um so some of the, the data logic or the data querying part or um, yeah, or people just at, and on top of it want to kind of choose it as as a normal database. They could, and and so and then they could potentially like like here write this normal select statement like give me the order key customer order date from order where the total price is larger than 100, and and we would automatically translate this. Sorry, translate this in what it would mean in well. And here you see again because they just the as as the data when when we uh, capture it or um organize it we organize it in this graph normal form so we're extremely flexible and um and and we know if you take talking about sql table then we have here this module that is kind of your your sql table name and then each column in in the sql table is its own relation that has its key here the key is for instance o for like order id and so on and then uh we can also write uh so some derived rules for instance like total price here for instance is um it's maybe not um a column in your original data, but you can, in our system, easily just could add this, and you see it's the sum over, over the charge and so on, and then you could just create it out, and and we can very very easily like express the SQL um, queries with group by and everything um, in in our language. So, but um, now let's get back to RHEL because that's uh, what what we are here a little bit trying to focus on and also what you really can now uh, express with it or, or what you can do with it and um before going um about uh, the, the query optimization aspect how uh, everything kind of planning to make it work and, and perform it so that uh, it actually also runs in and in, in in, in, in gives you a nice experience so let's go back to our um so we'll go to example with the ffa flight example so here again i can what in intelligent data app could look like is for instance you have your flight network where you have various flights in the US and you want to track them and maybe you want to build some kind of uh, some dashboard for for regulators for customers for for um, the airline um, um, administration or for for the, um, the the carriers that they want to analyze the performance of the network so so there are various types of reasons why you want to um, how you could build like intelligent data app on top of this, this this flight data and and you can ask for various things that you potentially want to look at is you want to look at how 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 planes are like delayed by season by the day of time by weather by areas by an airport like how how for instance alaska or the south um northeast compare so and, and how they fluctuate and so you kind of can basically um gain some insights from how they behave and then in that respect kind of like plan ahead and then do like better planning and and ideally even what we're also working on we'll see like in in the last part of our talk is that we're also more and more trying to um implement and support optimization techniques that can actually express mathematical optimization like uh, a linear programming so on in rel and to, to potentially like uh, optimize certain 
certain aspects you want wanna you wanna wanna improve. And of course, you looking at historical trends and so on. Um, it's, it's a class thing you want to do. And um, and another thing is, of course, flights happening all the time. There's I guess every given moment there's at least one airplane in in the sky flying from one airport to another. So so the app in general should be also like live, reactive, right? You have always data gets updated, gets added, and so on. So so all this logic also you kind of want to maintain to make sure if you query it that it's like um, reflects the latest status. And so in so going back to all the key aspects, basically this example, and we were talking about it a little bit again, and basically touches on uh, on these key aspects and well that we make use of to to make it work. So right, it's we you will see like right we again using the relational uh, data model and relational language. We use the declarative logic how we express our our our, our application logic. We use higher order logic because again here we talk about graphs and networks and so they are naturally like you you very fast end up writing higher order stuff also with recursion like you want to find shortest paths and so on and and we make also use of abstraction schema abstraction and so on and, and so you will see that i um, go through the slide so again here this is what you've already seen in the first part of the talk how our data roughly looks like what right? we have the, this big uh, white table with fifth carriers and so on and here flight times, flight delays, and so on. And um, and, and this idea, the first thing that you wanted to do is to to model again, what is the meaning of, of the data? And Cassie covered it already quite a bit, so I'm, I'm not like repeating it, it, it too much again here. So, but there is this idea again, like what does delay mean? What does transfer mean? And so on, so we really wanna um, define that. So then if you build like really apps on top of, of the database that they all have the same definition, right? Especially with delays, you could you can think about delays as maybe in a, feels like it's a trivial trivial definition of what a delay is. Right, you have these the delay column here, and you just take this data. But as we said, so there's in the real world there's always a lot of subtlety to these um to these data points. Is what does negative delays mean? What does zero mean? Does zero mean really it's on time? Or you see here if a flight was canceled, it also has a zero delay. So in that we're like uh, so, so you have to be very careful what you do there, or if you really have CSV data or SQL and potentially have the null. And so you actually, they have a lot of these like small corner cases that at the, maybe at the very beginning in the vanilla case, you don't think about that, um, that you want to, uh, really, uh, track and, and want to make sure that across your system, you have like a uniform definition, what it means. So that way, if you build multiple apps or stuff that you actually always get the same answer. And of course you also want to like that they're also based on the, the same data too. And and so there again, here we built this um, conceptual model where we really, for instance, also can define what is a heliport, for instance. Uh, heliport is, for instance, if you say it's an airport that has as a fact type a uh, heliport. Or a canceled flight is what we have already defined earlier, like a, a an entity type of flight. And, and it has kind of an attribute where the, in the canceled attribute is a Y. And so on, and in case you'll talk about here yeah, the survival delay and so on, so we can define and and again we make your use of what is a you can really also define our own coordinate system, right? If your system in, in well, since we, we have this expressive logic, you if you need a new data type or something to express something more precisely, you can just create it yourself. For instance, here we can create coordinates where we say like, oh, where's an airport? An airport basically is a value type. This is um a longitude, latitude, and um, uh, I guess, guess angle elevation, and um, and you see you basically provide these three uh, data points to it, and and here you see how this value type is generated. It's, it, it's it's a triplet with two degrees for longitude and altitude, and then length is kind of like gives you the height, and we see like the, the height effectively needs to be given in feet, meters, or miles, but also because Length itself is a is a value type. You know exactly now if you provide ten, you also provide like what units we have, so that we know exactly um, what we're talking about. Um, and so this is here our data model. You can um, uh, of this flight application how you can uh, visualize it. And for a visualization tool, we really love the um, the ORM modeling diagrams. Um, ORM stands for Object Role Modeling. So uh, because ORM goes beyond what 
normally you see with uh, label property graphs where normally you just have uh, nodes of your graph and then you have a connected and then you have the name of the edges you know for instance this is like you know it's located in or so on on and then normally in the node you have your properties but in, in all and 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 what, what fits really nice to our relational modeling is again everything is um is, is a relation and we have nodes. Nodes are effectively unary relations that just have like, if it's an entity, contain all the entity um, keys or hashes, for instance, of flights and aircrafts, then um, they can have properties. Your properties, you see they're um, kind of like these dash these boxes, like you know, have flight time basically is of, is, is of unit minutes. And then also we have various different uh, date time properties like actual departure, actual arrival, and so on. And you can, the nice thing, Ohm, you can you can model this. And on top of this, you can not just model their connection, what it means, but you can also give them uh, some much more, uh, some domain knowledge and some, um, give you some constraints about it. For instance, um, there's constraints if you have a bar on top of it, it kind of means the value has to be unique. So you can define, is this relation, is it a one-to-one -one map? Is it one-to-many? Is it a many-to-many? -many? So that, for instance, has, like big implications, especially if you give it to the the query optimizer, because if the query optimizer uh, optimizer knows that you know this is a one to one map, then you know it does need to re-index the that relation, and it just can really um, use it as is, or easily can 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 transpose it and so on. Um, and and the nice thing in ORM allows you to express it on top of the the overall like schema and connectivity, and and then you can even express like really complex um, constraints, for instance, up here, this, 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 this little circle there is, uh, is an, an XOR constraint that you say a flight is basically arrived, is canceled, or is diverted. So it's one of them. And, and so now um, these all models, we can now very nicely also seeing here visually, we can very easily trans translate into RHEL what they mean. And then RHEL again, now we, we make use of our integrity constraints that we have, we can can express them very nicely, and um, and we even have tools that automatically go from if you just model this, they automatically can even generate you these integrity constraints. And for instance, here we can then say like all the nodes um, of the relation, for instance, all all edge relations origin that connect like an uh, a flight with an airport, basically means that these this edge origin needs to connect a flight. With an airport where the first entry is a flight and and your second um, argument here is an airport then of course you can also uh, have some requirement statements you can say for instance if you have a flight every flight needs to have an origin so it needs to start somewhere so in that way here you can like, express these like uh, explicit like logical constraint um, and then you can go even further and say something here, for instance, function origin and function effectively means it's a functional dependence. So that means that the func if you know a flight F, you can you can from that relation origin infer from which airport it started. So so this basically this function imply uh, enforces here that this edge is a one-to-one -one map. So once you have a flight, it only has one um, or it, or at least a, a, a one to many, uh, it can only start from, from one airport. It's not a one to one because from an airport, multiple flights can start. Um, but so all, all these things we can very nicely express, and then we can here further go express as complex of a logic as we want. So we can here, for instance, say if a flight is a canceled flight, then it means there should be no flight duration. So because the flight was canceled. So that we can really clearly say like, uh, if data comes in, we can really ensure that the database stays clean and that we not kind of like um, somehow at a later point, um, data comes in and said, oh, it's a canceled flight, but maybe accidentally the flight duration was positive and we just kept it. So if we have this integrity constraint and we really install this in our database, uh, our database system makes sure that this fact is always true. Um, and then here, similarly, you can say like, if you have a flight, it needs, it's here, again, what we saw before in the ORM diagram is, is effectively this here is the corresponding integrity constraint. Every flight, for every flight in, in our relation flight is it's canceled, it's diverted, or it's arrived. And it, it has to be an XOR. So it cannot be canceled and arrived and so on. So, so and if you would enter a, a data point, 
that violates this, then like uh, our system would say like this is not allowed, and for instance, it would prohibit us from from entering this uh, dirty or uh, data that is inconsistent with our own modeling logic. And so this is really what we feel like is uh, makes our um, semantic layer and, and our data are really like powerful that we can define this and we define it in the database with the data. And now you can just connect your applications on top of it, whatever it is. And basically then you just like query these relations. And if you want, you can query them almost like SQL tables, but under the hood, all these kind of integrity constraints and dependencies, you know, they're all like uh, fulfilled and, and they hold. And of course, since we are um, declarative language, we can do all the standard um, also aggregations. So if you can just count flights, then we get the number of all the flights in our data set. Also, what, what is really cool in well is you can uh, express group by group by um, aggregations in a really nice way. Is it says basically here for every C, for every carrier, you count all the flights that's operated by that carrier. So we take this this edge operated by that connects the flight to the carrier, but now we do a group by, so it means for every C here, we count the corresponding Fs, uh, flights in for the carrier. And so basically now we're calculating how many flights it's used carrier, and here you, you see the, the ends on the right side, uh, with, with Southwest, Delta, and America roughly being all over uh, 4 million flights. Um, and then we can go, of course, go even further and also can ask what uh, what is the mean arrival time for each carrier. Again, here we have our group by, now we do a mean instead of the count. The mean again, I guess we showed before, through uh, our um, uh, higher order abstraction, effectively just it, under the hood, then uh, translate into a sum and a count. And then ideally um, gets optimized accordingly. And here again, we say within the mean, let's, um, go over every flight for, for a given carrier C. And now uh, for that flight, um, give us the arrival date and then and, and that set uh, give us the mean uh, base for each carrier. And then here we see the, the worst airline with the largest delays are like Airtran and Atlantic Coast. So, so they're defunct, they, they don't exist anymore, they're bankrupt, so I guess now we know why. And then the next one is then United. And uh, apparently the, 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 the best performance airline is Savine Airline. So, uh, so it's good to know. And of course, again, similar theme again, we can make the, these logic as, as complicated as we want. And through these like abstraction and so on, we can really write this logic, write them somewhere else, have this definition as higher order a uh, place that you can just reuse. And for instance, you can define something like a ratio. And here you can just provide then these two data sets about canceled flights and and the arriving flights. And then and, and this ratio relation here will, will then tell us for each for each airport, for instance, what is the ratio of uh, canceled flight versus flights that, that arrive. And here we see, for instance, the airport in Alaska is almost like 20% of the, the total flights they have are, are canceled. So it seems like they, they struggle a lot with weather and, and so on. And so this is kind of the, the insights you can do. And you can, again, then define them as, as new derived relations, effectively very similar like uh, Fuse in, in, in SQL. And then on your app, you just then only, you only call that, that type of, of, of view and, um, and, and then you can just display it as, as you want to. And, and of course we, in RHEL, you already have seen we, we can do more and more uh, also reasoning aspect that goes beyond just aggregation, right? You can do very uh, naturally, you can, you can express a recursive and transitive closure. So in, in, in the key feature section, you saw something transitive closure like the, the reachable and in, in this uh, pointless form where you don't explicitly write out your, your parameters. So here it's a little bit more explicit and we can have something very similar here, like with located in, X is located in Y. If X is located in it, there exists a T where X is located in and T is located in a Y. So of course then, um, so this is again, something again, that is very, very natural and, and transitive and you can express this and this way you can now even express it. You can express it as an integrity constraint if you want to check something. But here, for instance, we actually use it for, uh, creating new value or new edges. So for instance, if your data set only talks, is, is the neighboring one, let's say like, if you say a city is located in a state and then you only have a, a separate statement, uh, that state is located in, 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 in this country, like in the US, but you don't need to explicitly have the data point that that city is located in the US. You can 
through logic like this, you can automatically infer this. And now um, in, your, in your data app, um, that inferred logic, that, that new statements basically coexist with your original data that you just imported as CSV data. And so for you as the end user, then these two types of data, these, um, these uh, base relation or like um, EDBs and this derived relation that are kind of these views, um, or IDBs uh, basically feel feel very much the same for you, and and then here you see we can we can do that also very general concept. For instance, here we can define what is an airport distance. An airport distance between two airports, AP1, AP2. So you see here we can nicely say that there should be airports, and and then we calculate like then here we, we define the distance between the coordinates of of the corresponding airports. And then how is distance defined? So distance we define down here. And then we say distance is between two like coordinates and the coordinates have to be in this LL value type that we saw before. And, and, and these are then used and provided uh, into the heavy side function that again, you can also define in well fully. And, um, and then here you provide as a parameter the earth radius because I'm on earth. And then you, you see here via this radius is uh, provided also in kilometers. So we have, you see we really neatly track what units we're using that we're not like confusing and at one point using kilometers and we use miles and so on and and yeah and and then also because we are having this visualization what you saw in the past with relations we can do very similar here we have these relations that almost feel like operations that kind of act on two operators or, so, or on two values and, and produce a third value and so on. And, and then we can also overlay, we can have distance here, that, for instance, here they are based on this longitude latitude aspects. You can have then a separate distance relation that basically operates just on heights, on on length and depths, on, on time and so on. And they basically are uh, coexist next to each other and, and they would not interfere. And basically our uh, front end and compiler just based on and knowing then inferring that the data types of your data would then specialize which kind of under the hood um, actually uh, function and operation are executed. And here again, and down here, there's another example, for instance, around transfer counts, because of how often um, you need to transfer to go from airport AP1 to airport AP2 with a given carrier C. And so here now we can just, again, give this information to, to another relation that ideally like in, in the future, we will have in uh, in our graph library. So it's just a, a library um, relation that you just can use. Of course, you can also write it yourself, but we have more and more will have libraries that you can just reuse them uh, as you need. And here, for instance, then we just say like, oh, give us all the routes for a given carrier. And then um, we kind of condition and so like, oh, and then I want the shortest path lengths between the between two specific airports. And, and you see a little bit later, uh, uh, when you talk about query optimization about actually how the shortest path length is implemented this for instance again like a recursive query um, and then what is also where we need what, what we can do again with now with the scheme abstraction <clears throat> and you see here this this well code looks very much the same that it showed you before but is it is a tick different because actually node label here is schema information so this is the actually could be a relational name for like the flight graph is our module that basically contains the entire uh, graph data, the entire knowledge graph. And now um, the node label is effectively the, the type of nodes you have. For instance, you have a flight, you have an airport, right? you have a city and so on. So, and, and they are all under the hood separate relations. And here we can, can count them and say like, give us for, for every node type or node label, and then uh, count all the IDs in, in the label. And so you effectively get the count of all the nodes. So, <clears throat> but what we can also do is again, we can <clears throat> do nice group by queries and now we can do group by queries over this the schema and the data and, and intermingled. And here we say, for instance, for each node label, now count how many uh, nodes we have. And there we see like we have, for instance, over 37 million flight nodes we have around 360,000 aircraft nodes and, and so on. And and you can really um, express that here. Now we, and and here, as you see, it's really cool how we express the schema data and the actual data in the same way. So effectively in the VAL code, you could, if you write it like this and you don't explicitly here state what 
what the type of the variables have to be, you basically don't, you have no idea if it goes over schema or over data. And, um, and, and this is actually really cool. And you can push it even further. That means you can also use the same logic to not just create a, a graph representation of the data itself that you say, like, you know, you can fly from LA to, to Boston or something, and then you have a node, but you can also do it over the schema. So you can build the schema graph. So you say like, oh, what concepts are connected with what? So this is basically what you saw earlier also with the ohm diagram, but here now we can generate that in rel by itself. And um, here you see again, you can define here the schema graph module. So we have a module that now acts almost like a transformer where we provide a graph G, that G has now all our nodes and all our um, all, all, all the types like with the aircraft and the airports and so on. And now we say like, just give us a very simple graph that where we strip all the, the label nodes and we just collect, oh, sorry, we collect nodes and edges. And here we give, give me all the node um, and we, we, we here take that X, the X is again is the node label. So we, all the nodes are now the node label, the relational names effectively. And then down here on the edge, we say now give me all the, the edge names, but then like connect not the explicit data to each other, but connect what uh, node types are connected. So in that way we see um, uh, on the left, you see then, then, and then we can give that for instance to a visualization library like Graphis, and we can plot this. And this is the result you see on the left. And there you see, for instance, flights are connected in your schema to carrier, to aircraft, to airports, and so on. And you see also through which edge connections. And again, now you can, this logic, you basically can write, you can take this module and you can um, apply it now to every graph that you want. And it's basically very um, uh, universal. And that's, and that's what you more and more now are uh, planning to do to package them up in libraries and then make them available so that people just can use them and uh, don't always need to reinvent the wheels. But the cool thing is, as you see here, you can fully write them in RHEL. You don't need to have some special keywords to say, oh, now I want to query over the schema or over the data and so on. Um, and then you can do cool stuff like also your your recursion can now go over the schema. So you don't need to have recursion over the data, but now since the schema feels like data, you can do the same shortest path calculation over your schema and you could say, oh, give me all the shortest paths between between flights and states. So how do you get from flight to states? And then you see here, flight is up here, state is down here. So you can, flights are connected to airports through origin destination and airports are located in state. But, um, and so this is basically the, the shortest path. And so up here you see have twice, so you have two options. But now you can also say, oh, just give me all paths. I don't care if it's the shortest or not. And then you see, we can actually see here uh, how we go also look it down and we go from flight to airport to city and state or from flight to airport, city, county, and then state. And all these options down here, you automatically get. So, in, and yeah, and it's really cool. So you can really just write the same logic. Actually, this acyclic graph you can write, it doesn't need to be written uh, for the schema. You just write it generically and then just the, your, your front end compiler knows based on the data type that it, it infers under the hood um, um, what, what to do. And yeah, and then for instance, here's just a little uh, visual example around, uh, again, where we applied to the data set page rank in the shortest path and where the page rank is based on uh, is applied to the airports and then the shortest path, for instance, between two different airports and you can, it's highlighted here. And the page rank algorithm you already saw like earlier in the first part that Cassie presented, the shortest path um, you will see in a moment, uh, but there I think we, we, just for complexity, we show it in the shortest path lengths only and, and not the actual how we, we generate the path. Um, but again, this is also like, if it comes to shortest path, you would really need, um, value creation because each path is basically a path of a, of a sub path and, and an extra step. So you really also recursively create new concepts and entity types and so, uh, or entities. And um, yeah, so that way this is a really powerful, all, all the features we have to, to, to make all this work. And this also allows us really to keep everything in the database and, and really you, uh, there should be no need really to, that you need to go to, to Java or Python and so on to, to express these things. So, so how does it work? Um, so, so why can we do all this in, in the database? And um, the, one of the, the key answers is because of query optimization. So we have a really good uh, query optimizer, not just optimizes like simple joins or like 
um, and so on, but it really optimizes like your entire logic and it also can optimize across ag aggregation and, and, and joins and, and how they interplay. And, and so this is really also one of our key innovations around uh, semantic optimization. And, and they are the, the high level view of where we the semantic optimizers it is that you have your rel model, but you also have some knowledge that, for instance, you can express to integrity constraints that you uh, can say like, oh, here you, this relation has a functional dependence or is a one-to-one -one map. So, and then the, the, the semantic optimizer takes a rel model, takes all the, the knowledge all you explicitly define, and then trying to find equivalent, semantically equivalent rel expressions that are basically calculates the same thing and analyzes what is the best, the most efficient way to calculate it, then it, it, it spits out this optimized code and uh and then calculates the answer and gives you the answer back. Um and 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 how the semantic optimizer works it, it basically uses like certain types of channel constraint often uh a lot of these uh logic that's written of are around like semi rings and so on um and they are like you make use of instance if you know plus is commutative x plus y is y plus x and so on the same for multiplication is you have associated to you, you know, you have the identity for, for multiplication is one, for plus is zero and so on. And, uh, and, and also how infinity works. So, so you really make a lot of um, use of just like, like mathematical properties. Then of course, what you have with the maximum axioms, then also from the technical you make use of these functional dependence that you know that they that the user can define as domain knowledge. And then, of course, also the, the optimizer will make use of summary and statistic histogram. So it will analyze, it knows certain relation, it knows the basic statistic, like what is the size and so on, and that it can estimate like, oh, like when it comes to uh, join orders and so on, like how big are the loops and roughly makes a, a best guess estimate. And ideally even over time learns this, how it's better and better. And, um, and at the end gives you the, the, the optimal query plan. And so here's just one little example. It's for instance, the semantic optimizer, how it works for uh, uh, minimization is if you minimize like the sum of F plus G and you see F is indexed by I, G by J, but you see that two different indices. So they're actually independent. So actually optimizer will now, you can just calculate the minimum of F and then the minimum of G, and then we just add the minimum. So, uh, but then it knows, oh, if it's the same index, we cannot separate them. So this is kind of what you're talking about this, this math axiom so that knows it can like uh, push this aggregation uh, through the joints and so on if if it's possible or not. And for instance, for plus it's not here for for count and, and multiplication you can. Also, it does really cool stuff like here if we join something between R and S, but you start like here X and Y, they have to be different. So normally if you would not have that last statement the account would be again independent and you could split it apart, but because they have to here, because X and Y have to be different, so they become correlated. And, and the optimizer knows that actually I can rewrite this into something that where I have no, that just have a, a one. So basically I allow everything, so I don't make no condition and then just subtract the, the, the cases where X is equal Y. And now you can, in this way, like, we write this discount query into something here where it factorizes, and then you just subtract something um, uh, over a relation that is much, much shorter and you can potentially get much faster can evaluate. So, um, and very similarly, uh, you can do the same with, uh, if you now talk about recursion, so how we can optimize recursions and aggregations, you see here, if you have a path, it's an edge between X and Y, and then you define path recursively between X and Y if a path is from X to T, and then there's an edge from T to Y. And then you can, for instance, say shortest path length, it's just the minimum of the path so um of the length and and then the optimizer will know it knows how mi minimization and and addition works that you can like uh push the disaggregation into in, into the sum and you can actually um do vice versa that you have here outside the minimum and then here you you have the um the, the, the joint statement between the edge and the shortest path links here um inside and you see this is again uh Recursive query that has aggregation, so it's a, it's an unsatisfied and 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 again, so for graph queries, these kind of like uh, patterns show up all the time, and so that's the reason why for us it's really key to to have this uh, unsatisfied uh, recursive capabilities. 
and yeah, and here's a bunch of papers that um uh, by Hung and Co that really uh, uh pushed this and uh their various parts paper with best paper awards so and, and so on. So there are um, yeah, so so what the team is doing there or our um semantic query optimizer team, I'm just like really state of the art and that's um and all this all this um knowledge that they're really trying to uh that they implement in, in, in our system. So and, and this is why we're thinking our system can do this and we can really optimize these complex programs in our system with our uh with our query optimizer and we don't and there's no need for us to go to a procedure language like Java and so on. There's of course also something about uh uh, according to time check you here, yeah. Stefan, uh, maybe we should skip the, the incremental conversation if we want to get to the, the fun probabilistic stuff that you yeah. have. Before. Yeah, good point. Yeah, let me just stop here. So also, just very quick, so we can also do, again, for a lot of this live program is incremental maintenance. And um, so there the idea is if your database changes, also your views on the database get automatically maintained and ideally they get maintained in a way that is like minimal. So if, um, so that way you, if you have some rolling sum or so ever, you don't need to recommute everything just because you you add one more data point and ideally you you can your your update is proportional to the size of your of your data change and not proportional to the size of your data. And of course the idea is we're also um trying to make this incremental uh, maintenance work with with our in with in recursion and so on. So as well that even recursion that we're trying to only like up we calculate as minimal as as we need to, and um, yeah, oh, we don't have time for this. And so again, there are also again key papers and and so on, and from our team that uh that, that look into this. So now um, maybe what is a little bit um, um also a lot along the whole theme of the workshop is about trying to make it really intelligent and also really come up with a not just like descriptive reasoning like where you have hard rules, but also predictive reasoning. Uh, getting uh, machine learning and optimization really in, into the database and, um, and probabilistic modeling. And so this is something that is still like um, really uh, part of them more and more slowly getting into production like mathematical optimization and, and relational ML. Um, we are further apart than for instance uh, when it comes to simulation and probabilistic modeling is where we eventually want to be. But right now we're still more on exploratory phase and see what we can do then in our system. and um, Maybe let me go here a little bit further. So generally, I think there are there are two key ways how you can bring really um, this predictive reasoning in, into a database. So one uh, one approach is you just bind to external packages like you know XGBoost, MLpack, maybe TensorFlow, and so on. So in that way, the nice thing is you can really just make use of the specialized function uh, packages, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And and we have done that to some extent, as you see, especially with XGBoost, MLpack. But what we are really trying to push um, is, is that you really can write your whole machine learning model in RHEL and in RHEL itself um, and completely. And so this will give you some, some unique optimization and uh, speed up um, uh, possibilities where really, and again, the query optimizer can um, optimize your whole uh, data model, including your machine learning model. It can also express relationally and trying to find out that the best way to uh, to, to calculate it and, and automatically identify like independence, for instance, and then just factorize it out. So you don't need to necessarily need to create big data in between. And and one aspect um, that now I want to focus on more in, in this section is around simulation and probabilistic models. So a little bit where we there want to go. So this is more something that's more aspirational. So, but for instance, we know data is uh, real world data or the real world has a lot of uncertainty and noise, so it's not just always a straight line. Um, and generally, like, why if you think about what is expert knowledge, expert knowledge is normally you do a best guess that is some person with the domain and just kind of finds the best model with like some, and he defines the parameters, and that's a parameter you use. Then, um, in the second wave, is kind of where we do this data driven optimization, like with uh, uh, maximum likelihood estimate and so on, where you really just Based on the data, you're trying to minimize the error and then find the best fit. And um, but again, so the, the parameters are normally just one value. And now, if you go to probabilistic modeling, the idea is you really like uh, say acknowledge the uncertainty and and um, and um, and there you're trying to model uncertainty within your model and keep it in your model. And you say here your slope C is not just a value; it's actually a distribution. And this distribution is now um, 
uh, for instance, is a normal distribution with, with, with a mean and, and, a, and a variation. And, um, and of course, this is something you really want to do, especially if if your distributions are non-Gaussian on a normal, uh, if it goes to normally that works really well. And, but for instance, if you have non-Gaussian or more and more of these like a uh, multimodal distribution, then just having one uh, one value is, is less and less if, um, optimal to actually describe your, your system or the world that you want to describe. And and so that's where also a simulation comes in into a database where we want to um, um, really put that in so that we can handle these kind of situation and, and build like like intelligent reasoning uh, logic on top of it. And in that respect also, what is simulation? Simulation is effectively uh, a way how you want to compute all the possible outcomes or you want to calculate the possible outcomes of a probabilistic model. And the probabilistic model is basically just a logical model with random variables. And, and there are some key requirements for us to make this um, these probabilistic models work because again we have the query optimizer so we have this incremental few maintenance and so on and so we don't want to give up on all that stuff to doing simulation but this requires uh, some key properties for us uh, that these large, this, this uh, probabilistic model needs to fulfill for instance you need to always get the same value out regardless of uh, re-evaluating the same thing twice because again you don't uh, know if it's in a recursive loop so you're trying to find a fixed point you don't know how often it gets reevaluated it, it needs to be the value that you get back needs to be stable also execution reordering uh, should not impact the, the outcome and this is key because we run our query optimizer over it it maybe rearranges how it gets evaluated and of course if it next time somehow finds some different path because you added something it gets completely a different result um, that um, uh, also makes it then not very performance. And so there we found um, what is really um, for us works well is there's certain pseudo-random generators like uh, especially like counter-based, um, yeah, like like counter-based uh, PNG like three phi that are where the state of your uh, random number generator almost splits like a tree, and and it with, and with this way you can really uh, mimic the whole like uh, model or logical. Um, your probabilistic model that you're writing and and you can really split like along these lines where if you have a serial uh uh student number generator is then like every time you call it it goes to the next step so but then it becomes really hard to if you really had something twice but now your your state is your p and g is in a different state so you have a different value and and this of course destroys then all these good properties uh of our database um yeah so then here are a few little examples so um is for instance, we could throw a die, and, and how would that works? Uh, like if you're trying to throw a dice multiple times, you would just say, "Hey, let's have something uniform." A key here is effectively the seed that you would use, and then just give me a number between one and six, and uh, that seed here is our, our key. And then we say, like, output this for this die, where we just now iterate over that key from uh, one to five. So this is effectively our uh, throw ID, what is first experiment, second experiment, and so on. And this year on the, uh, the second column is effectively the outcome. So we can do, of course, then build up on there and say, for instance, let's throw n dice depending on the value n of the first dice. So this is now something where you have now some, some variable logic that, that depend, uh, random variables depend on the outcome of a first random variable. And, and this, again, we can express now very nicely in, in REL as well. So for instance, here you see our, um, multiple dice here oh, whoop, here in the second line is basically a, a dice that gets a new key that basically comes to the key it branches it off with, with an index from from i to the number of um the, the face value of the first die this is the die key so if this one is five then i goes from one to five and then we take this key and we split it five times in different uh and then we get five different uh keys again and then you apply it to die again, so you basically get um, then five different outcomes, and then and then we repeat that up here. We do that uh, three times, so three times we throw the first dice, and then depending on the face value of that first dice, we we throw three, five, four dice, and so on. And here on the right side, you see the outcome. You see the in the first experiment, um, so uh, there's only two ones, so it basically means we had the two, and then we throw two dice. And the second time we threw like one, two, three, five dice. So we got the five in the first and so on. And so this is now, um, you see here, but also with this 
abstraction that you have in Valve, you can express this kind of like logic really uh, compactly and uh, actually quite intuitively. Um, and and yeah, and, and then basically you can go a step further. Now you can view each of these experiments as basically a realization of a possible world and a possible world is basically also um, something realization um, um, of of your probabilistic model and what is a probabilistic model and database basically something like a probabilistic database. So now we basically can that way generate multiple possible database states of, of your probabilistic database and now we can do reasoning on top of it. So for instance, we can calculate something, give me the variance of the mean of each data set. So we take here our data set i, this is the basically our, the i index our possible worlds, calculate the mean for each world and then take the standard deviation across the worlds. Or something like um, with our dices, given what is the mean sum of each data set. So here we can calculate the sum for each of the dice. You know, one time we just sum up two dice, sometimes we sum up four dice and so on. And then we can take the mean of this and you see in roughly the mean would be 12 that you get on with, um, if you count all the faces up. And, um, and yeah, but then if you want to do, of course, more and, and you now add observations to it. So normally what you want to do now, you need to start also adding rejection to, to all the sampling because you ideally want to only keep worlds that uh, are in accordance with, with, with the real world that you observed in the past. And um, I'm not sure how much time you have, but effectively maybe you just take three three more minutes and a little slow, a fast go over it as, so so Vida, for instance, implemented an, uh, as, a, as an, Proof of principle, we kind of used the, the game Battleship. And so we said, hey, here we have the battleships, and let's see, like, what can we find the best strategy to find all the games of uh, all the ships? And again, this is very much a simulation problem. And then you can use the simulation around realizing all these possible worlds, how a ship can, how the ships fit on the on your map, giving your all all the moves you made in the past, right? You know, there are there's no ship on A4, there is a ship on C5, and now you, of course, need to create all the worlds that, that are consistent with your observation, and of course are also consistent with the rules of the game, so that ships, for instance, cannot overlap, and then you can count them, and based on this, like, um, then, for instance, do an um, uh, MLE and so on, and, and recommend the next move. And this here is, for instance, um, how we set up a shift, even setting up the ships and putting ships on the board is involves a uh, non-stratified rec recursion. You see here, we're starting with, with the key where because we want to put five ships on and we, if they overlap, we need to put another five ships on till we find a valid configuration. And each time the configuration is not valid, we want to remove the ships and put new ships on. So that way also here, we really have this negation in here. You see the knots and an empty and so on. Um, and then, so what are the strategies you can have with Battleship? You can, of course you can do just a simple one. You just randomly pick, uh, a place that's of course not ideal. Then uh, an improvement is once you find one, you're trying to hunt down the chip. That's I think what everybody would do. And then of course uh, you can have well, with the probabilistic model is you really try and give me observation. You're trying to find all, give me all the possible now ship configurations are valid. And then you just count and look on which field you're most likely to find the ship. And here you kind of see what is the likelihood of these different strategies to win, where uh, blue is the random. Uh, the screen in red is the kind of like the hunt down, the other one is a little tweak, and then the orange one is the probabilistic one, and you see really how uh, you're much early with much fewer moves, like 40 moves, you're, you're able to find all the ships. With the hunt down, it's roughly around a little bit over 60, and if you do random, you almost basically need to, to find all, all the, uh, need, need to hit all, all the fields. And, and here, this is kind of a little bit the math, how you would set things up. So this is a configuration of valid chips. Then you would calculate here your conditional probabilities to find a ship at a position x, y, giving an observation. And then normally you do would do an arc max on top of it to give me like what field has the highest probability. And the one thing here I want to sh show last is these, these three math statements, you can really nicely translate into well very easily. Here you say, what are your valid ship configurations? So effectively all the samples, the sample here is our, our sample ID. Um, and since we have this higher order abstraction, you can really nicely say like, oh, for this sample ID, you give me all the ships, and now we have this condition your ships not overlapping. So basically analyze it for that ship configuration. Oh, all the ships not overlapping, and it's a valid configuration. And then of course we have the second condition 
oh, also these ships need to be consistent with the observation we had so far. So you see again, we provide the ships and then here the analyzed guess is effectively all the guess we have, we know here's a miss, here's a hit. Configurations we have need to be consistent. And, and then to calculate the likelihood, what we do is we now take these, we have all these, these samples that are valid, we count them, and we count all the valid examples. We do a group by, by X and Y. So basically we count all the valid samples for each field. And then we just divide them by the total count. So it gives us the probability of finding a ship on each field. And then here down here, we just now perform an ArcMax over it. And, and down here, you see we, one thing that we exclude is, of course, we ex exclude the positions where we made a guess. If you know there is a ship, there are, of course, the probability of finding a ship there is 100. But of course, you, you don't want to guess the same field again. And so here's just some, now some plots, both of them, so you can really generate in our system. You see first, uh, you have no ships, you see the most best is to, to somehow look in the middle. And then as you find a hit, then you you, you see like you bet, you, you kind of want to follow this this hunt and target strategy, but there's some more uh, subtlety to it. So effectively it's more efficient if you do a real probabilistic. And so we're also looking at some sample strategies I'm not going into this. Um, and we were looking in the future, we want to build some really higher order abstraction that we really much more um, um, more intuitively um, and, and for users that can build these probabilistic models. Uh, but this is more something that we uh, that, that will come in, into years to come. And so there are a lot of cool advantages like doing the simulation in the databases, right? You do the gen data generation in the database, the database is the best place to handle your data. You can also handle really naturally out of core, out of this data. So you can really naturally like simulate a lot and, and and it scales and you don't need to think about it as a user. And then of course, at the same time, as, as your predictor reasoning is in the same place, now you have the query optimizer that optimizes the data generation and the analysis on top of it. And if, for instance, if it finds something is independent, it just like splits it apart, factorizes it. So it doesn't this in that way, it, it really minimizes data generation, data transfers, and so on. You don't need to move to a different system. It all stays on, the, on, on your same commute engine and so on. And, uh, yeah, and with this, that's kind of it. So just very briefly, maybe here, we're also right now working on uh, providing, for instance, uh, math optimization libraries that where you can write math optimization very much in well the same way. And under the hood, then we, we give it to like an existing package, for instance, that um, does like linear or, or mixed integer programming and so on. And and very similar, like also something with relational ML, but I don't think I have the time for this. And um, yeah, and with this, I think, um, I think that, that that concludes our talk is right. So effectively, the key message that we want to convey is what we want to, what we are trying to build here, Relation AI, is a cloud-native relational database platform that is like designed for structured, semi-structured data like CSV, JSON, and so on, with data and application logic together in one place. And I hope we showed you guys why it's really like a bit dangerous to have it at the same place. Uh, like with the query optimizer and so on, and showed you a few examples um, with the every flight example and so on, and show you a little bit what we are currently working on and where we still wanted to go and, and push our system to when it comes to like simulation, probabilistic modeling, supporting optimization and uh, relational ML, uh, yeah, workloads. And this, uh, yeah, thank you for your for your attention. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Uh...